the two men forced their way into the Ripper's apartment, not even knowing it was his. They were immediately greeted by the stench of rotten flesh. The walls were covered in blood spatter. A human ribcage, stepped of meat and organs, sat on the carpet in the living room. In the corner, Alexander's dog chewed on a human bone. In the bathroom, a human torso lay in the tub. And on the couch lay a bloody girl, barely clinging to life. It was Olga, 15. Close your doors, turn your lights off, and let's get started. Today's cruise to the dark side will take us to the biggest country in the world, extending across 11 time zones, Russia and its capital, Moscow. By the 18th century, the nation had greatly expanded through conquest, annexation and exploration to become the Russian Empire, the third largest empire in history. Following the Russian Revolution, the Russian Soviet Federation Socialist Republic became the largest and leading constituent of the Soviet Union, the world's first constitutionally socialist state. The Soviet Union played a decisive role in the Allied victory in the World War II and emerged as a superpower and rival to the United States during the Cold War. Despite its great technological accomplishments, the world's first human-made satellite and the launching of the first human in space, the Soviet era came to an end in 1991. In the aftermath of the constitutional crisis in 1993, opposing the then-president Yeltsin and the Russian parliament, a new constitution was adopted, and Russia has since been governed as a federal semi-presidential republic. It is in this post-Soviet context that our story will begin. In 1996, with the recent fall of the Soviet Union, the country switched its economic system to a more capitalist one. But the Siberian city of Novokuznetsk didn't benefit from it and was visibly suffering. The smog that used to wreck city buildings has dissipated, but only because the giant factory chimneys no longer bletched out smoke from the production of steel for grandiose Soviet building projects. The factories and coal mines are all gone bankrupt. It is hard to find anyone on the street who has been paid his salary or pension in the nationwide wage crisis of the past six months. Most people were unemployed or struggling to work a series of part-time or temporary jobs to try and scrap together enough money to keep a roof over their heads and food on the table. Poverty is etched on every face here, and hard times have bred harsh neglect, with scores of kids and teens roaming the streets, some homeless, some fleeing abusive homes, and some simply left to fend for themselves while their parents worked long hours. With their skinny legs and sad faces, they are the picture of vulnerability. They live in cellars, they beg and sniff glue, and they keep out of the way of adults who only mean trouble. In return, most grown-ups ignore the ragged children in this depressed Siberian steel town. They were ignored to the point that when they began going missing in spring 1996, there was not much attention paid. Many people assumed they had run away and most were too busy trying to survive to even care. As spring turned to summer, a woman, Lydia Vedenina, living in the apartments of 53 Panoreski Prospect, 
a rough apartment block where lights and elevators work only sporadically and graffiti covers all the walls, called the authorities, complaining about a neighbor. She said the man constantly played loud music on his stereo and there was a foul, rotten stench emanating from his apartment, but no one followed up on her complaints. Later that summer, while women were washing the rugs in the nearby Abba River, came upon them a gruesome sight, a human head floating in the water. Over the next weeks, heavily decomposed heads, torsos and arms would regularly wash up on the banks. More decomposed, dismembered human remains were found in a vacant lot. They would later be determined to be the remains of 15 children between the ages of 3 and 14. The fact that children's remains were found near a school raised an alarm with the police. Finally, it was not immediately believed there was a serial killer, and only after several large groups of unattended children disappeared, then a serial mass murderer was suspected as being active in the city. Otherwise, investigators of internal affairs suspected that organ smugglers were acting within the city's boundaries. Several criminal gangs from the Caucasus region were active in the city at the time, and police searched the baggage of outward flights. Additionally, several hundred internal troops and police officers were deployed to search for the killer. At some point, even thinking it was Oleg Rilkov, a known killer at the time. The police thought they needed to look for a suspect that would have severe violent mental health issues. Perhaps he or she might have been institutionalized before, so they searched the records of all nearby mental health institutions for anyone fitting the profile who had been released and living in Novokuznetsk. Their search turned up nothing. But if the Oriol Special Psychiatric Hospital had accurate records, police would have found that one former inmate, Alexander Spesivtsev, fit the profile completely. He had been committed to the hospital in 1988, when he was 18, for a brutal crime. But according to Oriol's records, Alexander was still safely in their custody. The investigation was stalling, and the police didn't know where else to look. As summer turned to fall in the city, the number of missing children, as well as some adults, continued to rise. The body parts found in the river and the vacant lot couldn't be identified without DNA, and in post-Soviet Russia, DNA tests were too expensive for most police departments, including Novokuznetsk. In late September, three more girls were missing, 15-year-old Olga Galtseva and her friends Nastya, also 15, and Zenia, 13. Unlike most of the other missing children, these three weren't homeless, and their parents notified the police. The police discovered that Olga had had a minor operation on September 24th, and afterwards her friends had snuck her out of the hospital. Through canvassing the area, they found a shopkeeper who remembered seeing the girls that afternoon. She said that the three seemed fine and happy. She also said that she saw an old woman approach the girls, and after speaking for a moment, the girls took the woman's bags and left with her. The shopkeeper described the woman as being short, with dark hair. Based on the fact that the woman was shopping on foot, they deduced she had to live nearby. That, along with the description, helped them to identify the woman as Ludmila Spesivtsev, whose son fit the profile, but was listed as undergoing a course of treatment at the psychiatric hospital. Without any more leads, and because of their social hierarchy, the police didn't make much more effort to find the girls, convinced that the trio 
must have just run away with boys to drink and take drugs. A month after the girls disappeared, a plumber who worked at the apartments at 53 Pionerski Prospect called the police. He needed to enter apartment 357 to unclog a drain, but the resident wouldn't let him in, which was a crime. So the police went with the plumber to apartment 357. At first, the resident wouldn't open the door. A man's voice told them to leave. He said he had mental problems and couldn't handle visitors. This alarmed the police. The two men forced their way into his apartment, where they were immediately greeted by the stench of rotten flesh. The walls were covered in blood spatter. A human ribcage, stipped of meats and organs, sat on the carpets in the living room. In the corner, a dog was chewing on a human bone. In the bathroom, a human torso lay in the tub, and on the couch lay a bloody girl, barely clinging to life. That girl was Olga, 15, his last victim bleeding from a severe stab wound in the chest. As police searched the apartment more thoroughly, they found 80 pieces of bloody clothing belonging to men, women and children, along with 40 pieces of jewelry. They also found a stab of naked victims chained to the radiator. Later, they would find a torso's missing head. It was floating in the apartment's building's water tank. Meanwhile, Olga was rushed to the hospital for treatment. She had a broken arm and multiple stab wounds to her chest. Once she could speak, she described something from a slasher movie. She said she and her friends had agreed to help the old women with her bags. But once they were in the apartment, Alexander began attacking them with a knife. Mother, son, and a fierce Newfoundland dog trapped them inside. Nastya fought back and hit him, which angered him so much he killed her right then. Olga and Zaina were then chained to the radiator, only inches away from the body of their friend. For a month, he kept them as prisoners beating them, burning them with cigarettes. He raped them repeatedly. He also tortured them psychologically, taunting them and making fun of their cries. At one point, he forced them to cut the flesh of Nastia's body and eat it. He disemboweled Nastia's corpse in front of Olga and Zenia, then flushed her intestines down the toilet, likely causing the clog the plumber was called to fix. Then he ordered his dog to attack Xenia. The dog tore the girl's throat out, killing her. Alexander then forced Olga to dismember her friend's lifeless body. Then he cooked her flesh in a soup, which he made Olga eat. All the while, Olga said Alexander's mother and sister knew what was happening. They would come by frequently and just ignored the dead body rotting on the floor and the two naked girls chained to the radiator. They even ate some of the soup he made with Nasia's flesh. Sadly, Olga died soon after giving her statement, but Alexander was still at large. As soon as the police began kicking in his door, he climbed out of the window to the fire escape, which he used to get on the roof, where he fled. However, Police did have Ludmila's home address, and they arrested her. Three days later, they found Alexander and arrested him too. Under interrogation, both Alexander and Ludmila confessed to their crimes. In addition to his confession, police had Alexander's diary, in which he had described killing 19 people but police suspect that there were as many as 80 victims based on the bloody items of clothing found in his apartment. Spasivtsev 
a 27-year-old with a mustache, a furtive grin on his face during his interview, proudly mentioned the meat piling up in his fridge and freezer, to the point he couldn't even close it. While recalling what he has done to the girls, his eyes lit up as if telling the best experience of his life. For him, human flesh was just a commodity to be traded. As we were leaving, Spesitsev asked us if we could organize the sale of his head, one of the officers said. He thought some institute might want to study his brain after his execution and might pay in advance in cigarettes. Alexander was found insane and guilty of four murders he could be linked to. Out of the 19 he confessed and retracted and interned in a mental hospital again. As of 2018, Spesivtsev continues treatment at the Volgograd Psychiatric Hospital with intensive supervision. Ludmila, then 60, as part of her confession, even though denying everything at first, ended up admitting to having a sort of cleaner role. She took the police to the various sites where she had dumped the bodies. For her crimes, she was found guilty of being an accessory and sentenced to 15 years in prison. However, she was released in 2008 after only serving 13. Because of her infamy, she and Nedesda, her then 34-year-old daughter, who was never charged with any crime and who used to work as a secretary to a town judge, just like her mother before her. The two women were forced to move outside of the city in a village about 40 minutes from the center. Even in her new home, her neighbors keep her under constant surveillance, reporting her movements on social media. Apartment 357 was locked up after the police finished processing the crime scene. It was never rented again. It is rumored to have an evil presence. Perhaps the spirits of the people killed there. As for the other victims, only a few of the remains were ever identified. Until DNA testing can be done, they may never be identified. But why? Why would he attack these poor kids? Why would his mother and sister even help him? Alexander Spesivtsev, or with his nickname Sasha, was born underweight on the 1st of March 1970 and remained sickly throughout his childhood. As a result, he had been bullied frequently. He became withdrawn and reclusive. His home life was similarly chaotic. His father was an abusive alcoholic who eventually abandoned or was kicked out of the family, leaving Alexander's mother, Ludmila, and his older sister, Nadezda. The three shared a tiny one-bedroom apartment and Alexander slept in his mother's bed until he was 12. Alexander, though quiet and withdrawn, frequently pulled pranks, engaged in petty theft and painted graffiti on the concrete walls of their apartment building. Ludmila, his dotting mother, always defended her son, protesting his innocence or claiming some justification for his behavior. But she had a close relationship with her son, and she even shared a rather macabre hobby with him. As an assistant to the local prosecutor, Ludmila often had access to crime scene photos, which she would steal and bring back home to look at with Alexander. She was obsessed with them and transferred their obsession to her child. They even kept their favorites in a scrapbook. By the time he was 18, Alexander was obsessed with murder. But he wasn't well mentally. In his teens, he had a series of mental breakdowns requiring hospitalization. After he was released, he moved into his own apartment, number 357, at 53, Pionersky Prospect. And he adopted a large dog, a Rottweiler. His mother and sister visited him frequently to bring him money and food, since 
he wasn't really working or going out much, beside when he was stealing from time to time, or walking his dog. Actually, on one of his daily dog walks, he made a 17-year-old named Eugeny Gusnokova. They struck up a conversation and soon began dating. It was Alexander's first real relationship. At first, he showed her his romantic side, reciting poetry, taking her on long walks and buying her flowers. Eugenie began spending most of her time at his place. For all intents and purposes, she really just lived with him. But his sweet romantic facade began to fade with time. The two began to argue more and more and Eugenie finally broke up with him. But Alexander was so enraged, he refused to accept the breakup. So before she could leave his apartment after announcing the bad news, he attacked her and chained her to a radiator. For weeks, he kept Eugenie captive in his home, torturing her. After weeks without news from their daughter, Eugenie's parents contacted the police. Knowing she lived with Sasha, that was the first place the police went to check to ask about her whereabouts. But once there, Sasha didn't let them in. There, forcing their way in, they found Eugenie, still alive, her body covered in bruises and bed sores. She was able to recount the horrors she had endured to the police before dying of sepsis from her infected wounds. Alexander was then arrested and charged with murder. He was sent to Oriol Psychiatric Hospital, where he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was also shown to have a very high IQ. There, with medication and therapy, he seemed to be doing well. Though his anger at the world still festered. Added to it, an episode during his commitment at the Oriol Hospital kind of got to him. During that time, he asked another patient to insert a metal ball into his urethra to make him more manly. This had the opposite effect, causing erectile dysfunction and genital pains. After three years, he was released from the hospital. But someone made a big mistake in his records. So it showed to everybody that he was still at the hospital. Because of this mistake, he was not assigned any follow-up care or supervision. Alexander was now free and under no one's watch. In 1991, a free man, he moved back into his apartment. Besides the help of his mother, he engaged in petty theft and selling loose cigarettes for money. He started socializing with homeless people and beggars, sharing a drink and discussing politics and philosophy with them. His favorite topic was the evils of democracy, which, in his mind, was one and the same with capitalism. He blamed the ills of the Russian society on democracy, and soon he began blaming the victims of this brutal system, the homeless and unsupervised children. His anger at them seethed. According to him, those who are poor don't have the right to live in this world. He saw them as trash that needs to be cleaned up. Then, in February 1996, he met a 20-year-old woman at a train station. He convinced her to come home with him, where they later started to engage in consensual sex. However, Thanks to the botchery surgery he had done while in the mental hospital, he couldn't perform. Apparently, the woman started laughing at him, which enraged him. As he had done with Eugenie, Alexander attacked the woman. He held her hostage for some time, beating and torturing her, before finally killing her. Soon afterwards, he lured a second woman to his apartment for the same treatment. 
Some neighbors reported they heard screams, but with the loud music blaring and knowing Alexander had mental issues, they thought the screams were his. In the spring of 1996, he decided to start cleaning up the debris. He encountered six boys playing in a vacant lot and approached them with a deal. If they would help him vulgarize an apartment, he would pay them. The boys agreed, and Alexander led them to the Grey Building at 53 Pionersky Prospect. Pretending to jimmy the lock open on his own apartment, he opened the door to number 357. Once the door was open, he told the boys the valuables were probably in the bedroom. Once the boys were all inside, he began stabbing them, killing them instantly. Once he had finished them off, he piled their bodies on one side of the bedroom and draped a rag over them. He left them there, feet away from the bed where he slept, for four days, for four days, before dragging them out into the hallway. A week or so later, Ludmila, his mother, arrived for her regular visit. But when she saw the bodies of the six boys piled in her son's hallway, she didn't call the police. Instead, she began chopping them up, naturally, as if it was part of her motherly duties. She loaded the pieces into buckets, which she hauled down the nine flights of stairs and out to the Abba River, where she dumped them. From that point on, Ludmila became part of her son's criminal hobby. She, as a small, elderly woman, could easily lure people up to his apartment, picking targets at random. Once Alexander was done with them, she would chop them up, chop up the bodies, and dispose of the remains by burying them in vacant lots or dumping them in the Abba River. But Alexander's bloodlust was becoming more and more that his mother couldn't handle anymore, and the bodies were piling up faster than she could dispose of them. So, in order to get rid of the remains more effectively, they began cooking them in soups and stews which they ate. They would frequently give the scraps to the dog, along with the juicy raw bones from Alexander's victims. In his jail cell, Spesivtsev spent his days writing poems and reflecting on the evils of Russia's new permissive democracy, which he believes had turned a safely regulated Soviet world he once knew into a violent free-for-all of corruption, vice and cheating politicians. As by police to justify his crimes, Spesivtsev answered with a shrug. How many people has our democracy destroyed? If people thought about that, there wouldn't be any of this filth. But what can you do? Only extreme disasters, famines, sieges, plane crashes have created such pressure for survival that people have broken the taboo of eating human flesh. And 70 years of Soviet hardship, revolution, war and, and political repression have left Russians with a bleak legacy of disasters and match elsewhere in the Western world. Starving peasants ate human flesh during a famine in the Volga region in 1921, which would brought on by brutal grain requisitioning during the civil war that followed the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Writer Alexander Sozhenitsyn is among those who refer to the practice among criminals escaping from the Soviet gulags of taking with them a, a political prisoner, known as a cow, to eat on the way to freedom, if they were going to get through. More cases were reported in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, during World War II, when Nazi forces blockaded the city for three years to starve out its inhabitants. But none of these tragedies of Soviet history explain people like Spesivtsev taking up cannibalism. Times are different. There are no longer any wars, famines or catastrophes. 
and he was not hungry. Both mother and sister worked and provided him with food. But in other places, the brutality of these killings and the mere suggestion of cannibalism might have created a sensation, as did the 1991 arrest of Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee serial killer and cannibal. But there has been no outcry in Russia. There, such crimes are surprisingly common. Always in rundown provincial towns, almost always among the unemployed, the drink sodden and the uneducated. Konstantin Bogdanov, a folklore expert at the Academy of Science, attributes these cannibalistic cases to a society rooted in Marxism and compares them with Freudianized accounts of sexual abuse in the United States. In the States, he said, people are trying to move on from the thinking of Sigmund Freud, the idea that people's basic mechanism of interaction is sexual. So, an American who wants to express his rage at his society will typically do so through sexually deviant behavior, rape, child abuse, sexual harassment, but here in Russia, what we're all trying to escape from is Marxism. And Marx believed that people always interact socially, as classes or groups. When people here want to find a way to manifest rage against their surroundings, they express their deviance socially. And what could be a purer form of antisocial behavior than eating people? But unlike Bogdanov, most Russians are little aware of the incidence of a crime as grotesque as cannibalism. Russia is divided into social castes so separate from one another that the concern of one group barely touches the other. Outside of Novokuznetsk, few Russians have heard of Spasivtsev. In town, anyone not directly affected by him has ignored the story completely. Until next time, stay safe. Let us take a moment of silence for the victims. <laughs>